and I appreciate. <laughs> well, so I, the leaves don't change here, so I'm always wishing I could end up in a place where the leaves all change colors. You actually have seasons. <laughs> yes. The cold front blew in last night, so yeah, I went outside earlier. I actually don't know what the temperature is right now. It was kind of, it was cold for us. It's 64 right now. That's cold for us. <laughs> That's sweater weather. <laughs> but we are live. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ashley. This is Dyslexia Coffee Talk. And today we have my friend Donna, and I'm not going to try to pronounce pronounce your last name now that I know that I've been reading it wrong for years. <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to take a pass at, at it. Is it Gargit? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> My Orton Gillingham training is working off. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for joining us. And um, like we were talking about, I'm really excited that you reached out to me and wanted to have this conversation. Um, you know, there's been so much promotion about dyslexic, is it dyslexic strengths, dyslexic strength, dyslexia strength as dyslexic thinking. That's what it is, right? Dyslexic thinking as a strength that you can list on your profile on LinkedIn. And yes. a lot of people are celebrating that and some people aren't. <laughs> yes. So, Let's talk about what is your perspective on that? So just to give everyone um, some background, um, my, I do have dyslexia and um, I didn't grow up knowing I had dyslexia. So I haven't had the opportunity to fully remediate my dyslexia. Um, I also have an organization, Blank Canvas Awareness Art, and we advocate for children and adults with dyslexia. So I'm very much, um, you know, this is something that I live. Um, it's something I advocate for, um, not just myself, but for other adults. Um, and so when I first saw, you know, this initiative, of course I celebrate anything that gives dyslexia some momentum or, you know, just shines a light on dyslexia because they're, definitely is not enough education about dyslexia. Um, but at the same time, I was, you know, a little alarmed that so many adults were almost blindly adding that skill um, to their LinkedIn page. Um, and I'm not someone that hides my dyslexia in the workplace. Um, you know, I always tell my employers that I have dyslexia. I can't hide my dyslexia, <laughs> um, it is very much apparent. Um, so I have, you know, definite needs, um, but I also have definite strengths. And so I think when we talk about dyslexia, um, I always talk about it from a place of balance that we, you can't talk about one without the other. Uh, we definitely have strengths, but we definitely have needs and there's, um, needs in the workplace that are not highlighted um, and not talked about and take a certain amount of advocating. And when we look at adults and, you know, everyone comes with different backgrounds, but for my generation and the adults right now, um, we didn't grow up advocating for our dyslexia. And obviously, you know, with your organization and my organization and many organizations, we're trying to change that narrative. Right. Um, but right now we have to work with what we have. And right now adults don't have the skills to advocate maybe necessarily in the workplace. And when we think about, this is a global platform for LinkedIn. So we're not just talking about Britain we're not just talking about um, the US, we're talking globally. Mm -hmm. So my concern was we're putting out a skill to help adults gain 
employment or keep employment um, and the gatekeepers, which is our human resource departments have little to no knowledge of dyslexia. Um, all they have is a lot of misconceptions. So mm -hmm. I saw it as this could be an opportunity to open the door to those trainings. But my experience has been um, human resource departments aren't aware. Yeah. Um, they don't have these trainings. And so I thought, oh my goodness, what, you know, I, I almost thought this is irresponsible. What comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Well, I think we definitely need the training first before we just put out um, a skill without knowing what that repercussion is going to be on a global le level. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. You know, I did a job interview once um, and I happened to just, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty open person and I just happened to say that I had a dyslexic child and you would have thought that I told her that my child had stage four cancer and was going to die tomorrow because she just went, oh my God, I, I, I'm so, I'm so sorry. And I was really taken aback by that response. And I was just like, <laughs> why? <laughs> I didn't say anything. I mean, all my everything was inside my head, but I was sitting here going, what an incredible lack of understanding of, of, of knowledge really at all. But as an advocate for my child, the amount of lack of understanding, even in my own family, about what dyslexia is and isn't has been shocking to me. I think what I find even more surprising is um, I love the work that Made by Dyslexia does. And so with what I'm about to say, please don't get me wrong, because I think that they're doing a really great job. But they're the ones that are pushing the dyslexic thinking skill set because, you know, Richard Branson is the one that's backing that organization. But at the same time, they have that video, the dyslexic sperm bank. Have you seen that one? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> I actually love the video because I, I, the, the people that come in and go, you should be ashamed of yourselves. What are, what are you doing? And that, but that just blind, uninformed position on what dyslexia is and isn't, that's so prevalent. And I think people don't necessarily understand how incredibly prevalent that lack of knowledge is. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as an organization, they did uncover some of those biases. Yes. Um, and when they came out with their newer initiative with this dyslexic thinking and, and coining this on, on LinkedIn, um, you know, I expressed my feelings on social media and um, it seems like they did respond with some additional training, which I was happy to see. Um, again, I just think as a community, we need more of that training. And, you know, we we bear that responsibility when when we put out something on a global level and to bring other organizations together, you know, mm -hmm. as again, an adult dyslexic. Um, there is a lack of advocating for adults um, and it really takes a lot of organizations coming together and the most important organization isn't the organizations that already deal with dyslexia, it's human resources. They're the first, they're the gatekeepers um, and I can't tell you, and I've been in a position where I was hiring people or working in the workplace where I heard others say, you know, one misspelled word on a resume, they're not going to hire the person or working through these applications. Everything is online. It is very challenging for adult dyslexics to just apply for a job um, with, with these biases. And so... 
I, and again, I'm not blindly saying this. These are things that I advocate for, that I work with human resource departments through my organization. And every time I work with the human resource department um, or just other people in the community that hold that position, mm -hmm. they are like, wow, I never thought of that. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to break these barriers and these biases so these amazing adult dyslexics can even get past the gate gatekeeper to show their strengths. You know, it really is about balance. Um, and I'm going to keep coming back to that because, um, you know, I don't want this to be heard in the wrong way. Like, I definitely see that we have strengths, but there's a huge hurdle to get past to even get to to shine the light on our strengths. Um, and that first step really is our human resource department. So, you know, really the goal of our conversation today is really to just open some minds of more advocating that needs to happen in our communities mm -hmm. and really working with different employers um, to, you know, tell them more to it you know, give that training, that education about what dyslexia is and, um, you know, get past some of these bias of one mistake on a resume, I'm not going to look at it. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean someone didn't look at it five, 10 times, you know. Um, so that is, that is what I'm hoping. And again, I know we have so many amazing um, advocates working for children and really working towards changing that narrative. Um, but part of that, I think we really need to talk about advocating, you know, in the workplace. Are yeah. we teaching our kids to advocate in the workplace? Are we having those conversations? Sometimes I feel like we don't have that balance. We just lean the other way that, you know, we, and of course, part of my organization does talk about self-esteem and building them up. But again, are we having those practical conversations of how are you going to talk to your employer about the needs that you have? Um, you know, my personal experience, I've had wonderful employers that went out of their way to get me the tools that I needed. And then I've had others that, I mean, I was seriously bullied, um, by coworkers that found out that I was dyslexic. So I think our children need to know what real life situations are in the workplace to just better prepare them um, mm -hmm. and give them those opportunities. I completely agree with you. And I know, I mean, I work for an organization that's in the Fortune 100. And so I'm, I'm a part of the group internally that's trying to advocate for change. And I think in our current day and age with the push to embrace diversity and inclusion, the opportunity exists to include neurodivergence in that. But I think exactly what you're saying, there's still an enormous amount of training that needs to happen in order to enable that. Because I, I know that I have been a part of conversations where people are like, we need to do this, we need to do that. And I'm like, those are fantastic ideas, but, but that may not work because of there's, you know, there's, there's a lack of understanding here. You know, there's training that needs to happen before we do that, you know let's not put the cart before the horse or, you know, to use your expression, the chicken, what comes first, the chicken or the egg. I'm like, and what we need to understand too, is we're in a position where you're talking about people that potentially have an enormous amount of trauma too, from their school experience. And now they're adults and, you know, they may have a dyslexic children themselves. And so that trauma is now multiplied across another generation, you, I mean, there needs to be not just training, but understanding and empathy that exists in that so that 
are you dyslexic? You know, let's, let's just, you know, go ahead and shoot that question out here during an interview. You know, the person may very well be, but there may be some fear about self-identifying that they may not be willing to voice yet. And so what I've been trying to push more than anything else, I'm like, we need to have the supports just automatically in place. We have this massive internal website. There's nothing, there's no tool, there's no icon that you can click in the upper right-hand corner that will read that page to you. Um, you know, closed captioning, that, that's one that everybody pounces on, but there's so many other things that can be done in order to make the materials that are available for our community of fellow associates so much more accessible given various neurodiversities, dyslexia being the most prominent, of course. But I was just like, can we talk about tools and having just easily access accessible things, what Microsoft has done for their office tools. Is that automatically turned on on all associates computers or do associates need to go to IT and make that request? <laughs> it's like, these are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, over all the jobs I've had and a lot of my jobs, you know, have been working with the public as a social worker, um, where I've had a good mix of being out in the community, but then having to document my day. <laughs> um, and when I was a licensing coordinator, um, so I licensed people to become foster parents, I had to use a state document that didn't have spell check. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is a nightmare. Like I can't <laughs> do this. So I talked to my boss and she's like, well, this is a state you know, there isn't much I could do other than if you write a letter, I will try to get it to the right person. Um, and so that really was probably the first time I advocated for myself in the workplace and was able to get spell check on that document. Um, but again, that took me advocating for myself. And I, over the years, you know, wasn't it really wasn't until I dived into dyslexia with my girls <laughs> that I felt stronger about talking about my own dyslexia. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, there is some trauma, you know, with the amount of training um, that I had to every year go through mm -hmm. and having to read. And, you know, again, like I talked about, I had some instances where you know, I've always been very forthcoming about my dyslexia, but, um, and for the most part, people have been helpful, but there was one coworker that really took advantage of that. And I found out later, she purposely made me read out loud and um, kind of snickered about it. So um, that's awful. I guess when we look at the platform again of this dyslexic thinking, and we look at LinkedIn and what types of jobs people are looking for, it is more geared towards, I would say, corporate, mm -hmm. but everybody uses LinkedIn, right? Because as we're looking for jobs, it's just a really great platform. Um, and so that was my other concern, you know, when we talk about equity or, you know, not every job is the same. And right. so... And, you know, I've worked for smaller nonprofits where they couldn't afford Office 365 that has all these really great fancy features that I need. Now that I work for the state, I have that access and it was already on my computer. I didn't have to advocate for it. Um, technology, just the advances of technology have helped so much. I like, I'm so grateful for Grammarly and all these tools that I can use because now I'm in a position where I'm writing emails to legislators and, you know, it can't be misspelled and, and look unprofessional. Um, and without those tools, that's what it would be because <laughs> my dyslexia has not been remediated. So I guess, you know, again, the concern is we put out this, this skill and again, we need 
all the different employers to understand what those needs are at the same time, knowing what those strengths are, you know, being able to balance, you know, that, yes, I may need extra assistance with writing, but at the same regard, I will be an excellent person to help develop policy and have a global understanding of what's happening you know, in the workplace or, you know, to have, bring more to the table with collaboration and, and things like that. Um, and both of those aren't really highlighted in a way um, when we just put out the dyslexic thinking and just the strengths. Mm -hmm. And so I think we really need that support from human resources to ask those questions. Like you said, no one ever asks like, or checks in with employees, right? Like, do you need anything extra? <laughs> you know, do you, you know, have any additional needs that we should be aware of? I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, mm -hmm. But man, if someone would ask me that, <laughs> I would give them a grocery list of, <laughs> yes, I need X, Y, and Z. And you know, I work with so many adults that are still not even able to read at a third grade level, you know, and they're still working in a workplace, mm -hmm. um, but really struggling. Um, and they're not getting the higher paid jobs, but if they were given more tools, they would be able to get those jobs. Um, and so, again, some of these adults that I work with do have that trauma, do have um, a lack of, you know, advocating for themselves. And when we talk about the workplace, shouldn't we be talking about what those needs are for those individuals? And who is the person that would be our go-to person to address those needs? Um, and again, I, I think it really is our human resource departments, but on a global level, I don't know, like, is that the setup in every workplace everywhere? Mm -hmm. I don't know that I could really answer that. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder if when Made by Dyslexia came up with this initiative, did they take that into account that we're not all these super entrepreneurs with a lot of money that are, you know, working in the workplace. We're everyday people. Yeah. Um, so I just think we need to consider the everyday adult dyslexic. I, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, I mean, cause Ernst and Young put out, uh, put out their, their report about, the benefits that they have seen from increasing their workforce and embracing neurodiversity and how that's you know benefited to their bottom line and how they're encouraging everybody to to do that but there's not an not enough major corporations i think have have gotten to that point yet they're they're talking about it they're working about it working on it working about it <laughs> working on it, but those, you know, the, you're talking about extremely large organizations, you know, what about the companies just like you just brought up that, you know, maybe have less than 10 employees or, you know, have 50 to hundred employees, you know, what, what is it that they, that they know about it, that they're embracing about it and I just, you know, I'm, I'm replaying some of the conversations in my head in regards to things that people have said about me, about my own child with his dyslexia. You know, I had, I had a family member who said, well, I'm sorry, your kid is stupid, but you know, and I'm sitting here going, he's not stupid. <laughs> dyslexia has nothing to do with intelligence, but based on her uninformed bias from her experience in life that wasn't something that she had encountered really and so she you know that was just something that that she thought about you know when we were talking about 
the dyslexia sperm bank, you know, I'm thinking about that one woman who walked in, she, she was of an older generation and said, y'all should be ashamed of yourselves. So again, there's that, that bias that dyslexia must obviously mean somebody of low intelligence when again, dyslexia has absolutely nothing to do with in, intelligence, but even in the advocacy that I do on a day-to-day, -day, um, or in my day-to-day -day life for my own child, I have run constantly into that assumption that because he's dyslexic, there's only so much really that he's ever going to be able to accomplish in his life. And that's been the most dumbfounding thing for me that I, you know, for lack of a better expression, the brick wall that I'm constantly running into going, <laughs> I'm going to try to be kind about this, but that's extremely ignorant. Why? Let's, let's talk about that because it's just not true, but you're right. And I've said this within my own organization. I'm like, this is a tread carefully place because you can't, you know, hoist the banner and say, we do, every, you know, we support our neurodivergent employees because it, if if you misstep somewhere, then that's not true. And that's all the community is going to remember is that you had a major misstep. But if you do it right, you have an opportunity to have a resounding boom go out across LinkedIn as just an example, but across corporate America, and that will have a trickle down effect to organizations everywhere that here's a major organization that has done it right and done it well and truly supports all of their employees. Everybody needs to be doing this and, you know, engaging in trainings and learnings, et cetera. I mean, I need to shut up. <laughs> but that, that's been my that's been the thing that I've been the most passionate about in these conversations that at least I've been having in my own workplace and trying to raise awareness for that. And you're absolutely right. It begins and ends with, with HR because they are the gatekeepers. You have, you know, think about somebody who can't make eye contact. I mean, I'm kind of looking all over the place and I, you know, <laughs> eye contact, something I've never really been like super comfortable with, but, um, you know, during job interviews, I'm sitting there forcing myself. I'm like, look them in the eye, look them in the eye, look them in the eye, look them in the eye. But what, what if that's a, you know, through an experience that you've had, or maybe part of, part of your challenge with your neurodiversity, that that's something that you just, you're, you can say that to yourself all day long, but you just can't do it. <laughs> You know, there are people that are really turned off by the fact that, well, you know, they, it was a great interview, except they couldn't look me in the eye. And so they must be hiding something. And so, you know, moving on, or even in the screening questions that you get when you do apply to a position online, you know, it asks you, do you, uh, are you a citizen? You know, do you have a visa that needs to be sponsored? Um, are you a veteran, uh, race, um, gender? And then are you disabled? <laughs> if we could get to the place where maybe are you neurodivergent, footnote, we offer, you know, enlist everything out. <laughs> right? That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I never fit quite into those like exact boxes I feel like and that's where dyslexia lives right we're outside the box um, with everything with the tools that we need and the great skills that we have and thinking outside the box and providing solutions that others don't think about but when you tell someone you're dyslexic the first thing they think of is you're going to reverse letters and numbers and that's it it just ends right there um, and there's so much more. Um, and so, of course, you know, it's great that this got people talking about dyslexia. I think the term dyslexic thinking opened some doors in, in those discussions. Um, and I just think we need to balance out that a little bit more with additional training and really you know, even our advocates that are advocating 
for kids and all those organizations. I hope that they add this to another place that they could be advocating. And, you know, when we talk about mentoring kids, that we are preparing them for the workplace, that we are preparing them to be able to ask their employers for the things that they need. Um, you know, I know as, as parents, we advocate um, to the 10th degree of, you know, getting the tools they need in school and they see that and hopefully we're becoming great models. Um, but having the discussions of you're going to need to do this in the workplace, you know, and hopefully it won't be such a hurdle. Hopefully there'll be more understanding in general um, with the public, you know, that we're not just advocating in the school system. And that's why, you know, my organization really tries to use art to educate the public about dyslexia because it's not just our teachers that need this understanding, it's our community. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just hope this conversation really gets some more people thinking along those lines and how we're advocating, how we're preparing our kids. Um, and hopefully they have the understanding that I'm not coming at this with just a negative light, but a place of balance that our kids, our adults have needs um, and we definitely have strengths. And how do we have the conversation that really tackles both? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think, you know, again, the, it, it's those trainings it's building our adults and supporting our adults and um, teaching our communities that, you know, although you can remediate dyslexia, there's still, you know, different challenges that are, you know, involved with everyday life. You know, there was a point as a social worker where, you know, I have to drive to different houses and, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I don't enter in the right number into <laughs> uh, MapQuest, I have ended up like at a shack. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this clearly is not the right house, you know? <laughs> so um, people don't think about like the everyday challenges of an adult with dyslexia um, and technology is great, but it only gets you so far. Yeah. And so, you know, being able to have that understanding and giving space for more adults to, you know, really have that, um, that, that understanding. And I think it's hard for, for people to understand the adult dyslexic population because we're such a mix you know there there are adults that have had their dyslexia remediated but then there's some that haven't there's some that are still illiterate um and we're pretty much a mixed bag at this mm -hmm. point and I, I know as a movement we're hoping that that's going to be less and less and more of our kids are remediated but we're not there yet right. and we need to find that balance hundred percent. So it kind of gives me a few thoughts. And one is, and I actually had the opportunity to say this to one of the leaders of the organization that I work for as I went, you know, one of the things that as an organization, we need to embrace from a management perspective is managers need to be trained that not everybody that reports to them is going to think and process in exactly the same way that they do. And over the course of my career, I've had so many different managers who, you know, I, I had one manager once who refused to repeat herself. So, you know, Donna, I need you to go, you know, pick up these boxes at this location and then go to this other location and drop 10 of them off in this third location and drop five of them off and you know on and on and on and on and on and he would go I'm sorry I'm trying to write that down I'm not going to repeat myself we should have been listening the first time that type of okay <laughs> um but just yeah. 
the the why 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 are you doing it as fast as I could do it or you know why did you why did you do it this way instead of this way and yeah you still had this you still had the solution that I was looking for but why just those general kind of lack of understanding that leaders within an organization need to be open to alternative ways of thinking um another thought I have is one of the things that I've been vocal about is our children need to be involved in the advocacy for them. When they're really little, it's not appropriate because, you know, it's just <laughs> when they're really little, that, that's a hard thing to do. But, you know, when my son was in fourth grade, I started having him attend IEP meetings and he doesn't attend all of his IEP meetings. But I'm very open and honest with him in our, inside of our own home about what it is that I'm asking for and why that I'm asking for it and why it's important for him that I'm asking for that. And it's a two-way communication between us. And I told him, you know, once you get to a certain point in your education, you will attend every single solitary meeting from beginning to end because you're also a January baby and halfway through your senior year, they're going to look at me and go, you're out. <laughs> Yes. And the remainder of your high school is going to be completely up to you unless you choose to bring me in and, you know, you, you want to go to college. I'm, I'm not going to be there for that. And you need to be able to advocate on your own. So this is a, this is a muscle that you need to develop for yourself. And he fortunately has been very open to that, but we need to be doing that with all of our children. And then my third thought is, um, I'm thinking back to my, so I, I have a master's in business administration and I'm thinking back to my grad school days and all of the HR professionals that were in the program that I was in and the types of conversations that we had, et cetera. And they were definitely all open to learning, but I feel like too, it needs to be something within the curriculum and not everybody has a degree in what they do, right? Fully recognizing that. But it needs to be part of our undergraduate and our graduate curriculums about diversity and inclusion. And that needs to include neurodiversity, I'm thinking. And, but to your point, it needs to be a core training depending upon what your role is. If you're gonna be a manager, you need to be trained on it. If you're gonna be in HR, you need to be trained on it. Yeah, I mean, and so, I've been trying to break through on how do we do that? How do we implement that? How can I, you know, it's been really difficult to get to the organization. Um, I was trying to even just create a poll and was like, nope, sorry, you can't create a poll within our organization for HR. And I was like, but the people that I have talked to, you know, one, they admit that they don't have the education um, mm -hmm. and they seem to be willing to learn more. It's just now, how do we bridge that gap there um, mm -hmm. and make that a meaningful and, and part of this dyslexic conversation? Because, um, you know, I'm someone that's you know, more than, you know, more than words, like, what am I going to back this up with? Like, how am I going to put this into a plan of action? And I know many people listening are the same type of people, um, you know, and I hope that our dyslexia warriors come together and work towards the workplace because we are raising children that are going to be in the workplace and some sooner than, than others. And, you know, even my first job, you know, thinking about how difficult those initial jobs can be when there isn't the support um, for someone that, you know, a lot of times those initial jobs are dealing with money, you know, and how difficult is that going to be? And I looked for every possible job that didn't deal with money, and I've definitely found it. <laughs> I think I worked at a gym. I was just taking membership cards. There was no money exchange, you know. <laughs> um, but that's not going to be the case for all of our kids. You know, we want them to feel comfortable with any, you know, instead of avoiding, um, we want them to feel comfortable and supported in anything that they choose. Right. Um, so how do we support that? How do we start bridging those gaps 
Um, you know, I think some of us advocate in a way to, you know, again, give those needs and strengths when we're talking about extracurricular activities and dance and sports and, you know, so this is like one more level of, okay, now the workplace, like, let's mm-hmm. add that into our advocating. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they're in school to get to that next level, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's not that far away. A lot of our kids want to start working, you know, age 16, you know, they're, they're ready. Like, I want to make my own money. My daughter tells me, and we're already having these conversations and she's only 13, um, ready to join the workforce. So, <laughs> um, you know, I just hope that this conversation um, sparks something in our advocates to want to fill in the gap with the needs in the workplace and the strengths, you know, and that we're already talking to our kids about this advocating in school is going to help you later in life. You know, I know a lot of us, um, we become these role models and as they get to the teenage years, it's more of an eye roll (laughs) than, um, uh, you know, cheering and, and, you know, we went to the first um, dyslexic rally and my kids were much younger then and we had these cute signs and now that's shifted to no I'm good I don't want to go eye roll so that's yeah. fine um, as long as they still see you know I know they're still sponges and they're seeping in and you know my daughter will say in the class you know I don't need to read out loud or you know that's not part of my, that's part of my IEP I don't need to read this out loud yeah. So I know it's getting through and I hope that it's going to carry over when she gets to the workplace and she has a need and she will be strong enough to say, I need X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, but it would be great if we could provide that additional support in the workplace where she didn't even have to ask. Like mm-hmm. you said, how wonderful would it be if there was an additional box that there was a place for what tools do you need in the workplace? You Mm -hmm. know, it doesn't even have to maybe have a label, but just have that conversation of what tools would be helpful because that would help everybody. You know, I'm after the inclusion um, and the, the larger conversations that to be had. And, um, you know, if we can help other people along the way, (laughs) um, I'm definitely all for that. And, um, you know, I know there's a lot of parents out there too that, you know, want to see just the strengths. And I hope this conversation, you know, I always talk about it from a place of need. You know, our kids have specific needs um, and that, we give that equal weight to their strengths Um, and words matter. You know, I never use the word weakness because I don't think it's a weakness. Um, And when I look at my organization and just my personal journey of having dyslexia, not knowing growing up, but, you know, really struggling in school, struggling in the workplace, um, my organization is really kind of that symbol of turning a a need into a strength. You know, I needed more support. My kids needed more support. And now we have this organization that is helping other people. And, you know, my background is psychology. So that is the ultimate goal is being able to turn those needs into strengths. Um, But in order to do so, we have to have those conversations on what are the needs and have those trainings with the people that can give us and our community what they need. Yeah. And I can tell you that I've run into pockets of incredibly small organizations, nonprofits that are usually, um, you know, central to like the town that they live in some, you know, that's what I mean by something small and pocket-based where, you know, they're raising awareness within their community for organizations and, um, you know, meeting with hiring managers and making proposals and 
trying to assist with the hiring process and things like that. Um, I've come across another organization um, that actively speaking with where they actually provide uh, recorded train. They can do both actually recorded and live trainings for hiring managers and HR departments on um, dyslexia, executive function, hiring practices, things like that. And um, they're a very small organization, but you know they have the potential to have a massive impact. Um, but the organizations have to be open to that. And of course, there is a transaction because they, you know they cater what they do to the need of the organization. And so, you know, what they're providing isn't, isn't free, of course, it shouldn't be because they're, they're putting time and energy and effort and their materials are, you know, very high quality. So, um, but there's, there's pockets that I'm seeing and to your point, you know, we need we need to have a convergence of all of those pockets and all of the advocates and kind of bring everybody together in order, I think, to continue to push that awareness. It can't be siloed in certain things or, you know, let's let's put uh, dyslexic thinking as a strength on LinkedIn, which, again, I applaud on one side and I'm fearful of on the other. Um, and in my head, I keep going to one particular coworker that I had at one point who whispered to me that she was dyslexic. She didn't tell anybody. Of course, she was an analyst as well. And so she's doing, she's somebody who's doing literally nothing but crunching numbers all day long. <laughs> and she told me, she was like, Google has no idea what I'm trying to spell. They never do. And so she's trying to do something. She, she, she was like, I will spend forever on Google just retyping the same word over and over and over, trying to get to the point where Google finally understands what it is that I'm trying to ask. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas I... if we could turn on a tool where she could say, hey, Google, here's my question. <laughs> you know? Now, now she's more efficient because her use of time is, is maximized, but you have to turn that tool on, you know, and the people that control IT need to turn that tool on for, for the employee base. Yeah. I mean, that, that brings up a really good um, example. And, you know, our hope is that with it being highlighted, we're talking about dyslexia more that we could combat this, the bias of dyslexia. So our adults dyslexic don't have to feel that shame in saying I have dyslexia, um, you know, because that shame holds us back and it's only, we only give it power because there's a lack of understanding. If we had if more people were educated about dyslexia, that would just dissipate. You know, mm -hmm. yesterday I was in a meeting and so I supervise individuals and um, we were had a work session and I work remotely. So this is all, you know, on a team's call and I'm helping them, you know, dive into some of these applications and they're throwing out the application numbers at me. And I was just like, oh God, I had to have them say it like three times to get it right. So I just shared with them. I said, just so you guys know, I'm dyslexic. And someone else on my team was like, me too. And I was just like, oh, yay. Like there's just this instant connection when someone else tells you they're dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And we know one in five, right? Like that's a huge percentage. We're just hiding in the workplace. We're there. Um, we have strengths We're we're doing the work, um, but we're not talking about it, yeah. <laughs> you know, and if we had more training, mm -hmm. people would make those connections to, they would see the dyslexic thinking because they'd be like, wow, that person is amazing at their job. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you're dyslexic, um, you know, or, you know, so yesterday I had the conversation with, um, you know, the lady that I work with and she's like, but you're so great at your job. And I was like, yeah, just let me know if you ever need some tips and tricks to, you know, that I've been using because I am only good at my job because I have this extra support 
with the technology. Um, and I've learned tips and tricks over the years of how to get around things that are really challenging. And some things take me longer than other people. Um, but no one sees maybe that effort, mm -hmm. which do we want them to see it sometimes? Sometimes, no, we don't want them to see that it's, you know, taking us longer. All people see is that I'm just, a, you know, someone asked me a question, I'm going to respond, I'm going to get it to them. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, we get into that conversation of grit. Um, and so that dyslexic strength or that dyslexic thinking, we have to really ask ourselves, where is that coming from? Because sometimes that's coming from a really difficult place of, you talked about trauma. Yeah. Um, there's this amount of anxiety of, I want to make sure that I can perform. And some people go over and now we're at a place where we have to be perfect or overperform. Mm -hmm. um, and we could combat that with the right training to allow adults with dyslexia in the workplace feel more comfortable, to feel supported, to not feel like they have to outperform everyone mm -hmm. else because they have this thing that they're trying to hide. Right. Um, again, it's it's that balance that we really need to see. And that, that only comes with, with training, not just being able to put some words on an application, words mm -hmm. that the gatekeepers don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, again, I, I guess we just need more training. We need to, you know, help our, our youth um, feel like they can advocate in the workplace mm -hmm. and not have that sense of shame. Um, you know, every day, I feel like I'm always educating people about what dyslexia really is. Um, and I know the first thing they think about is, oh, she just reverses, you know, letters and numbers. Um, and so we have to just do better, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and, uh, you know, it's always a great way with October Dyslexia Awareness Month. And I know a lot of people, you know, spend a lot of their energy on October. And so, you know, that self-care is also important for our advocates. Um, but I hope that in the coming months, you know, you get your energy back and put a little bit of energy into um, having conversations about dyslexia in the workplace. Yeah. Where my brain is going to, though, is the number of people that were never diagnosed that would benefit from the same tools if they were available and may not know that they have dyslexia, but you know, if the tools were readily available, could access a tool and go, gosh, this, you know, this suddenly makes what I'm doing a lot easier to do, then you're capitalizing on what they're already able to do. They're able to gain more confidence. They're able to move through the organization. There's just, there's more, there's such a global benefit to, just turning on the tools for everybody's use. Even yes. if you don't ask your employees to self-identify, there's just, there, there's a global benefit across the board. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I had a coworker because we were working remotely and we were tasked to read like 85 pages of policy a day and I was just like are you kidding me like did you guys forget I'm dyslexic and I have not remediated my dyslexia yeah. um, so they would check in on me and I was able to find the read aloud on office 365 and I was just like oh this is amazing I just turned this on I could listen to it um, so my other co-worker she just found out she has ADHD and she's 50 years old um, and before she found out, though, she's like, Donna, how are you keeping up with the reading? And so I told her, you know, I was like, oh, there's this tool on Office 365. It's really easy. You just click here and it reads it to you. She's like, really? I was like, yeah. So, I mean, that's a perfect example of people that haven't been. I mean, I wasn't identified till college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a huge percent of people. Um, and like I was saying, you know, it is, it's about inclusion and helping everyone. Um, and, you know, when we talk about equity, 
you know, again, people get confused about it being equal, but really what we're talking about, and especially dyslexia in the workplace is, you know, we just need a couple extra tools to, you know, fall in line with our coworkers. So it's that image of the steps of a kid looking over the fence that I think we've all seen where, you know, there's a kid without the step and he can't see over the fence. And then there's a kid with two mm-hmm. steps and he can see over the fence, you know? So that's the same thing that we need across the board in the, in the workplace too, um, because the strengths are there. Um, we just need a little bit of understanding and some tools to help uh, mitigate our dyslexia. Um, but again, the other, you know, the other, the last thing I just wanted to comment on is, you know, again, dyslexia is um, on this continuum and everyone's dyslexia is not the same. And right. so when we educate people about dyslexia, it isn't the same conversation. Um you know, there's people that I know that, you know, have, you know, some people say, oh, I'm a little bit dyslexic. You know, again, we have a range (laughs) of dyslexia. Um, And so I think with that training, there needs to be that understanding to combat some of these biases that people have about about dyslexia. But I just want to thank you so much for having me today and and letting me um, have this conversation. And yeah, thank you. Well, and, you know, again, I'm so grateful that, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll never forget as soon as the dyslexic thinking came out, you know, you pinged me almost right away and went, we need to talk about this. And I'm like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So thank you for, you know, wanting to have the conversation and talk about the other side of, of this, because I It is critical for corporations, I think, to understand both sides of it, you know, that it's just not, you know, a banner that one can lift and, you know, wave proudly and say, you know, yay, yay me, that there's enormous education and significant barriers that need that and should be broken down in order to truly embrace diversity and inclusion in in the workplace, whether you have five employees or a hundred thousand employees. So thank you. I this has been a great conversation. I'm so blessed that you wanted to do this. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and for everybody else, have a great day. Bye. <laughs>